Hi, my name is Pam Flaherty. Welcome here to City. I am the President and CEO of the City Foundation, and I'm also uh, responsible for our citizenship activities uh, here at City, which includes things like human rights, uh, environmental sustainability, and other important issues. I want to offer my congratulations to ICCR, Calvert, and the Institute for Human Rights and Business uh, on releasing this report. We've been uh, hearing about it for a while, and now <laughs> it is here. Uh, and this issue of how human rights relates to business is a really important one. Um, we released our first statement on human rights in 2007, and my colleague Val Smith led that effort. And I will tell you that when we first started it, when we talked to people internally, and remember this is five years ago, uh, uh, people sort of looked at us like, you're doing what? You're doing the city policy on human rights? Um, and I think we've come a long way since in terms of understanding the issues, the intersection, the importance to business. We're very honored to have been uh, the first U.S.-based bank, bank to uh, join the Global Compact and recognize its role in helping companies to define and implement their approach to human rights. Um, we think about human rights and our business in four areas. One, of course, is our employees, which relates to our diversity efforts and our labor practices. And I'll come back to that one in just a minute. Our suppliers, human rights in the supply chain and the risks therein. Our clients, included in the equator principles and our environmental and social risk management policy. And then finally, the whole area of countries where we do business. Um, we have operations on the ground in more than 100 countries. So clearly, there's a range of human rights issues involved in having employees and operating on the ground. Um, we participated in the consult consultation process during the development of the UN Guiding Principles. We have also been quite active on the steering committee of the Equator Principles Association, including this most recent effort to revise them, including reference to human rights. Um, my colleague, uh, Sean Miller, where are you, Sean? There he is. Um, Sean uh, was the past chair of the Equator Principles Association, uh, and as I said, has been very involved in the, the latest revisions. Within the corporate responsibility to respect human rights framing, we are big believers in the uh, know and show concept. Um, through our work on the equator principles and environmental and social risk management, as well as the current process that we are going through to update our policy on human rights, we're working to continually try to know, to understand what are the risks, what are the issues, uh, and then secondly, to show through our annual citizenship report what we are actually accomplishing. And in our update of the human rights statement, we intend to take a proactive statement of support and affirmation of the UN guiding principles. I also want to acknowledge that I was at an event earlier this morning. This is International Women's Day. City is celebrating with 180 events in 125 cities in 85 countries. So starting at noon yesterday to the end of the day today, we are celebrating around the world. Yay! And although it's not typically framed as such, at least in the dialogue in this country, we view the human rights issue of uh, gender diversity as a very important one here at City. I think it, it's fair to say that this has been a challenging issue for the financial services industry and sitting down here in the, in the middle of our um, corporate client and trading and capital markets business. Uh, let's just say the representation of women is probably not what we'd all like it to be. But we have lots of efforts underway to make sure that we continue to make progress. Um, we have a signature effort inside City. It's called City Women. Um, and it, is, it involves both men and women across the company in terms of making this an issue that we work on every day. Um, I will make two quick other comments on, uh, on this issue of uh, diversity at home. One is that uh, we strongly support all elements of diversity, whether it's gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, religion, etc. cetera. And um, we recently signed as an amicus brief uh, as a friend of court against the Defense of Marriage Act, and I'm very proud that our company took that 
uh, took that point of view quite publicly. Uh, and secondly, I have to say in front of our friend Bennett Freeman that yesterday we were recognized as one of the top two companies uh, in our diversity efforts. So we know we have a long way to go, but we are very proud of our record to date. I think each industry has its own unique human rights challenges, and we all have shared ones too. As there are many investors in this room, I appreciate that it can be challenging to discern what the key issues are for each of the sectors, but I want to thank our partners at ICCR and Calvert and IHBHR for their leadership in fostering a dialogue, which after all, at the end of the day, is the way we make progress. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this winter day. You all get extra gold stars for actually making it here. Um, wish we had a better view to share with you, but I'm sure we'll have ongoing dialogues in the future, and maybe you'll be able to see outside the window. So thank you, and let me turn this program on to the main and important part. Um, I'm Bennett Freeman with Calvert Investments, and Pam, thank you so much uh, to you and Val and all of your colleagues at City for uh, hosting this event. It's indeed been very long in the making, but I hope uh, well worth the event, and thanks to all of you also for making it through the weather. Um, you know, Pam, I, um, you mentioned the uh, Calvert report that came out yesterday. It was our third biannual report. Uh, rating companies on their diversity practices. We looked at the S&P 100, and it's just a very happy coincidence that this time, uh, City was top of the pops. So congratulations for all of your efforts. Um, I have the um, honor of introducing somebody in absentia who we'll see uh, in a video, uh, John Ruggie, who had hoped to be with us today and learned just a few days ago that he had a major conflict with his day job as a professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Um, he will be with us in London for a similar launch event uh, next Friday. I, the one thing I say about John is that uh, I think it's fair to say that without his mandate and the tremendous work and contribution that he and his team did, we not only would not have the guiding principles now to take us forward, but we would not have consensus in the international community around the very basic proposition that companies in all industries share human rights responsibilities together with uh, states and with civil society. It's really a monumental achievement. So before turning to John, I just do want to recognize the members here of Team Ruggie, as it was known informally, and for all of John's leadership, uh, so much of the uh, hard work and research and real intellectual firepower uh, came from an extraordinary team. Uh, and we've got uh, here uh, Caroline Reese and Christine Bader and Amy Lair, uh, all seated I think toward the back, it sort of looks like the Last Supper yeah. tableau. But yeah, that's right. But um, we're uh, we're delighted to have uh, each of you here, and each of you as individually and collectively as part of the team made a really historic contribution to the field. So with that, David, you were going to cue up the video. Hi, I'm John Ruggie. I'm sorry I can't be with you. Um, my day job at Harvard, alas, um, got, got in the way, uh, uh, as it sometimes does. But I'm, I'm very pleased to join you um, uh, virtually uh, to uh, um, launch uh, or to help you launch the, uh, the new report, Investing the Rights Way, a guide for investments um, on business and human rights. Um, I want to thank my, my colleagues at, at, at the Institute uh, for, business, uh, for Human Rights and Business, um, as well as Calvert, um, and the ICCR for the work that they put into producing um, the, this very important uh, report. And I'm also encouraged to know how many of you um, 
uh, are there and have participated in discussions as this report uh, was evolving. I'm very grateful to you all. This, this builds um, obviously on the guiding principles that I developed over the course of six years um, uh, um, and which the UN Human Rights Council um, in the first time, for the first time ever uh, uh, endorsed um, in June 2011. What I mean by the first time was that the Human Rights Council had never endorsed any kind of authoritative guidance on business and human rights. So that was a first. And the other first was that um, it had never endorsed a set of normative principles that governments didn't negotiate themselves. Um, we presented them and governments voted them up or down, and I'm happy to say it was up, um, and, and the up was unanimous, uh, which of course gave it a, a very special um, authoritative nature, and it helped uh, introduce the ideas of the guiding principles into a whole series of, of other institutions, national um, and international. International, the International Finance Corporation, the OECD, uh, the International Organization for Standardization, the European Union, et cetera, et cetera. Nationally, um, at the EU level, um, governments are developing implementation plans. Um, in the United States, um, the human rights due diligence provisions um, of the guiding principles found their way into Section 1502 of Dodd-Frank. Um, in the new um, uh, reporting requirement for American investors investing in Burma, uh, the guiding principles um, are to be referenced as a benchmark uh, by any American investor um, investing more than $500,000. And so um, the, 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 the seeds have been planted um, in a number of places and not simply um, institutionalized uh, in the UN itself. Now, the guiding principles make it clear that, that all businesses, um, irrespective of sector, irrespective of size or where they operate, all businesses have a responsibility to respect human rights. To respect human rights means to not infringe on the human rights uh, of others as they go about their business. And businesses can know and show that they are respecting rights by um, following or, or adopting an adequate due diligence uh, procedure, um, which we outline uh, in some depth um, and, and some detail uh, in the guiding principles themselves. Now, the, the, the principles are established, they're out there, uh, companies are acting on them, as I say, international institutions of one sort or another uh, are out there as well. But I remind you that the guiding principles themselves provide fairly high-level guidance. Um, and uh, for uh, more granular content, um, something that can be translated for um, uh, a, uh, a, somebody at a local site who ha has a particular decision to make, there we need to drill down further um, in terms of, of sectors. Uh, we also need to pay attention to the special um, features of small and medium-sized um, enterprises, which can't be expected to have the same systems as a large global uh, multinational. Um, so the next task, the next task is, is to go more granular um, and the financial sector um, is one of the areas um, in which uh, this work is now being done. Um, the, um, uh, the OECD is doing a mapping exercise of the financial sector um, in relation to uh, human rights um, issues. Um, I'm discussing with UNEP FI uh, in the context of, of some work I do with Foley Hoag, uh, looking at these issues um, for, for banks. A, the so-called Toon Group of banks um, is drafting um, guidance um, for the banking sector specifically. Um, and the investment community, of course, um, has and continues to be actively uh, pursuing the discussion uh, amongst themselves. The International Finance Corporation has played a significant uh, role um, in, in this context and of course the equator uh, banks, uh, the 80 or so banks um, uh, that uh, track the equator uh, principles um, are um, also um, hard at work um, in revising the equator principles to give recognition to recent developments in the area of business and human rights. So I'm very pleased about, about all of that. Um, now this, this new guide that you will be discussing 
is the start of a process uh, of reflection for uh, investors. Uh, absolutely key players um, in, in the whole chain um, uh, of, 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 of players involved um, in, in business, in, in, in investing, um, in, in, uh, in commerce. Um, and so for, for you, some things will be the same. Um, your workers, uh, your suppliers, um, the responsibility to respect in relation to them, that's, that's the same as for any other business. Uh, but um, you also have a special relationships with investee companies, um, and, and, and that needs to be uh, clarified um, a bit um, more than it has been to date. Um, parts of the investment community has been very active in addressing uh, particular human rights um, issues, um, uh, trafficking, conflict, minerals, what, what we're hoping to achieve now is to, is, is to encourage the development of a more systemic uh, approach, a more systemic um, uh, uh, um, development or intervention that will have cumulative effects and begin to truly move markets um, overall by uh, making human rights due diligence a regular part um, of your investment decision making um, and engagement um, with, with companies. Now, what, what, why are we doing this? Well, we're, we're doing it, obviously, in the first instance, to um, reduce the incidence of corporate-related um, human rights uh, abuses. Um, and uh, the, 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 the major tool, um, adequate human rights due diligence, um, is intended to, um, to, to help establish um, the a business is social license to operate um, in addition to simply whatever legal license to operate it, it, it already has. The benefit for society is, is, is obvious. Um, as human rights challenges are reduced and managed better, uh, also this will help rebuild trust um, in business. I'm sure you well know. Um, the, um, the beating that the uh, business community uh, and other social institutions, um, not the least the U.S. Congress, the beating in institutions are taking in terms of public trust. Um, and knowing and showing um, that you are managing the human rights implications of your work well uh, is one key way uh, to restore trust and to rebuild um, the social license uh, to, to operate. Now, I don't underestimate the challenges um, of, of, of doing these, um, these things um, and making them happen, uh, but um, with dedicated people um, and, and institutions like yours involved, um, I, I know that, that, that we can do it. Um, and um, so I want to thank you again for your commitment, your engagement, um, thanks again to the Institute, to Calvert, uh, to the ICCR for providing uh, 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 this new valuable tool that we can now use uh, to build further on. And um, I, I wish you a, a fruitful conversation. Um, and if there's any way uh, down the road that I can be helpful, uh, you, you know where to find me and I would be delighted uh, to, uh, to be engaged. Thanks so much. Uh, so today we'll have uh, uh, Bennett will start out, and Bennett, of course, is from Calvert. It really chairs the, it heads the, the research uh, and public policy uh, dimension of Calvert's work, and they've been a really strong partner and member of ICCR for years, for decades, uh, and we very much appreciate uh, their participation. Right. And then uh, we'll hear from Margaret. Wachenfeld, who is from the Institute for Human Rights and Business, legal advisor, has a long history of working in the human rights space, and we're very, very happy that uh, she really uh, pulled together uh, the, the, the guide as we know it. And then uh, last, but probably least, myself, uh, making a few comments about how we might use the guide uh, in our uh, investment decisions. Bennett. Thank you, David. <coughs> You can sit if you want. No, I'll stand. Um, I'm glad, uh, David, that you mentioned that Calvert's been a longtime member of ICCR. I would say that we've been a leader of the secular humanist wing of the Interfaith Center, 
the corporate responsibility. <laughs> Uh, but when we work together, we do take our orders from uh, nuns and ministers, and very happily so. Um, this um, report had its genesis in, the IC in an ICCR conference room over two years ago, in December of 2010. And I just want to take a couple minutes to tell you what motivated David and I in having that initial conversation that led to this report, and I, I can't emphasize enough, though, that I'm not sure the report would have ultimately been delivered without the Institute uh, stepping in and working with us. But um, we knew in December 2010, uh, just taking one look at the draft, then brand new draft guiding principles, that they would uh, be a landmark document uh, when finalized. Uh, the following June of 2011. And we recognized um, potential to advance several different objectives. Um, first was a shot across the bow, if you will, of nation states uh, admits this whole debate over businesses' uh, responsibility for human rights that uh, the first responsibility for of protecting human rights indeed lies with, with nation states. And I think the guiding principles um, clarify that well, building on the framework of 2008. Um, second, um, we recognized that uh, companies, uh, particularly those that had uh, doubted or even resisted uh, the basic proposition that they too share with nation states uh, a responsibility at least to respect human rights would not be standing on firm ground or really any ground uh, after the guiding principles were inevitably uh, agreed. And I think that that indeed has been proven to be the case. The argument is over, over whether business shares human rights risk and responsibilities. Uh, it does in that unanimous endorsement uh, by the UN Human Rights Council seals the deal. Um, we also uh, recognize the opportunity for victims to gain access to remedy, uh, perhaps the most human, visceral, and really important part of the guiding principles, but also uh, NGOs in the human rights community uh, who may have been ambivalent um, about the guiding principles as a whole and skeptical, if not critical, of some of their gaps or particular aspects would nonetheless be able to use the guiding principles as a floor without treating them as a ceiling. And I'd, I'm happy to think, at least based on um, how views have evolved within the NGO community over the last year and a half, that uh, at this point, mainstream human rights NGOs pretty much have coalesced around that proposition that the guiding principles are indeed a floor to be nailed down uh, while at the same time working to raise the ceiling. Um, but the other opportunity that we saw, uh, and the one that really motivated us uh, most practically to undertake the guide, uh, was for investors. And you know, the ICCR, uh, faith-based investors, their secular humanist SRI uh, uh, colleagues, uh, we've been around human rights for not years, but decades. Uh, so the proposition that we uh, needed to be mindful of human rights risks and responsibilities uh, in our own portfolios and our shareholder advocacy wasn't new to us, even though we continue to learn and our views and understanding evolve uh, year by year, issue by issue, <laughs> industry by industry. But we saw a really remarkable opportunity, and this is the, the heart of it, the matter, to use the guiding principles to really solidify a nascent understanding and acceptance in the broader so-called mainstream investment community around that same proposition, that investors too uh, share human rights risks and in turn responsibilities both to their shareholders but also uh, as, as human beings with who have their own moral compass. Uh, and 
To be fair, mainstream investors have been exposed to human rights issues for years. Um, whether in the context of the South Africa divestment movement in the mid-70s to the mid-80s or more recently uh, uh, in the Sudan divestment movement, which was at its peak in 2006 and 7, and I remember meeting with Pam and Sean and uh, Val and others here at City in that context. So these issues aren't new to big banks and the large institutional asset managers. But we wanted to do this guide to be a practical tool <coughs> so that investors across asset classes could, without much sentiment, sentiment or moralizing getting in the way, could use the guiding principles to assess that risk. And we hope also begin to recognize the utility of engaging with companies that they own or may own uh, in encouraging them to uh, address that risk and share those responsibilities themselves. So this, tool, this guide is, is first and foremost meant to be a practical tool. And we hope that in hard copy or online that it's going to be uh, at the, on the desks or on the shelves and frequently taken off the shelves uh, by investors uh, in the United States and indeed uh, around the world. So that's really what has motivated us to uh, take this basic proposition that companies face human rights risk and share human rights responsibility and extend that out uh, amongst investors. And uh, we're hopeful that the guide will find an audience, that its uh, uh, message will have resonance, that the due diligence tool that we believe the guiding principles represent uh, for investors, in fact, will make a difference uh, every day. So with that, thank you very much, uh, David, and on to you, uh, Margaret. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Hello. As you have probably all figured out, I'm Margaret Walkenfeld. I'm from the Institute for Human Rights and Business, and we're a think and do tank, as we've started to say. And one of the things we think about is, is that resonating too much? No. Okay. Is about how to apply the guiding principles and other issues on business and human rights more broadly and to write about it. So that's how we came into collaboration with Calvert and ICCR, and I just want to thank them for the great collaboration on this project. I also want to thank City. I think it's a great signal to the rest of the financial sector that you're hosting this. So thank you very much for doing that. And I also want to thank those from the community who helped us work on the drafts of the guide. I know a colleague is here from UNPRI, and I got a lot of help from the Secretary in London and others, and they are recognized in the, in the opening of the, of the guide, and you'll see that. So thank you very much to all of those as well. Um, I also want to say happy International Women's Day. So, I'm going to talk very quickly about what's in the guide, just so you know. And as David said, he's going to then talk about how to use it. So there's two things that the guide addresses. One is the kind of the how in the process, talking about the GPs. And then there's a second part of talking about the what, what are human rights about. So coming to the process part, as Pamela pointed out in her introduction, there's two levels to this. There's what investors are doing themselves in, in their own house about their responsibility to respect, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis their workers, their procurement practice, their privacy policy. That's one level that thinking about responsibility to respect. But the guiding principles also apply, as John Ruggie pointed out, to business relationships. And in business relationships are the business of investors. And so as a second level, the guide is focused very much on looking at how investors can use the guiding principles as part of their risk management and engagement processes. And again, David's going to go into thinking about how you can use it. I'm just going to tell you very quickly about the kinds of steps that are covered, and that's the steps that are in the guiding principles talking about the importance of having a public commitment to human rights. That's step one. Then you, once you've made your commitment, it's the idea of taking action on it. And that's what's termed human rights due diligence. 
and you'll see that that's a term that is familiar, right? Due diligence is a term that many in business know about, and the guiding principles have built on very familiar concepts and processes that businesses have, and due diligence is one of them. And the point of this is the idea that you actually, you're weaving human rights in to the standard practices that business has, so that addressing human rights issues becomes a regular and a systematic way of doing business. If it becomes a checkbox where people say, oh, you, did you ask them about human rights? Finished? Then we will all have failed. Instead, it's about becoming much more systematic and bringing human rights into the everyday way you do business. Just as an analogy, it's a very simple analogy. Think about, for those of us who are old enough and remember how office buildings used to look at night when everybody had the lights on. And now you would never leave an office building in the evening. Everybody knows you switch the lights off. Well, why is that? That's because the environmental community was very effective in talking about how small steps can be taken to lower the impact on the environment. And it's just become a regular way of doing business. So that is the idea of becoming a regular way of doing business. So as you're doing the, do, so I said it's part of the due diligence process. You know that as you go into a new, do, do an, a company does an acquisition, you're moving into a new country, you're looking at a new um, company to invest in, you're doing due diligence. The difference with human rights due diligence is one, it's about human rights obviously as a subject, but it's also instead of looking at, at the company you're investing in, looking at risks to itself, <clears throat> it's about looking at risks on the company's operations impact that it has on people. So instead of looking inwards, it's looking outwards. And that again will be a very familiar concept to anybody who knows anything about environmental impact assessments that look at impacts outside. So that's, part, that's the first step in the process of identifying potential impacts that you want to ask the companies that you're investing in, have they done this process? Second is then, what do they do about it? So there's the action point of trying to prevent, if they know what those impacts will be, trying to limit the impacts. Then tracking, how are they doing in terms of what, how effective have those actions been in either eliminating human rights impacts or in limiting them. And again, this will all sound very familiar to anybody who knows about management systems. So it's that same process of building human rights into the regular systems that companies have. And, and then as Pamela noted earlier as well, it's important to show. You talked about reporting. Reporting is one way, but there are many different ways of communicating. So really the guide goes, the guide goes through those steps. And it talks about these core principles about being proactive to avoid harm. And the other core principle that Bennett also talked about is if there is harm of doing something about it. That's a basic principle of human rights. It's about justice and accountability. And there's a discussion about grievance mechanisms. So that's, in a nutshell, what the first part of the guide covers. It talks about the guiding principles. It has a section on why it's relevant to investors. And then there's a set of questions that you can ask the companies that you're investing in. And the questions really are gauged to judging the quality and the effectiveness of the systems, the investee companies that you're investing in. Is that a good quality system to be able to manage human rights? And in doing that, you're managing, you're limiting risk to people, as Bennett said, and you're also limiting risk to the company and to you as investors. So that's part one, that was the how. Then there's also a second part of the guide that talks about the what, and that's talking more about human rights issues, what they are, talking about the fact that there are a whole set, I'm sure that everybody in this room knows it, but a lot of others don't. I was very surprised in meeting with a CEO of a company at one point, and he said, well, human rights is just about doing the right thing. It's part of it, but there is a whole set of standards out there. So there's, there is a framework out there that you can work from, and that's actually, I think, very helpful for companies, that there is standards out there. The harder part is that there's not a set list of human rights that you can just run down and tick. Human rights depends, and if you think about it, this makes sense. 
no operations in different countries, in different sectors, in different settings will necessarily have raised different implications for human rights. So how do you figure that out? You figure out what the implications are by going through the processes I just talked about. But you're not starting from a blank slate. And that's the, what the second part of the guide tries to bring that out. There's been a lot of work, as everybody's talked about already, on looking at human rights through a sectoral lens, looking at different issues. We talk about different groups, such as women and children and indigenous peoples in the guide, just to give people a little hint about what's out there and the resources that are available. So you're not starting from a blank slate. So for, and anybody who wants to know more about it can just go look at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center if anyone hasn't seen that, and you'll see what a wealth of resources are available out there. So in that sense, the guide matches up the substance and the process. And so we hope with those two pieces, it's enough, as John Ruggie said, to take the first steps on really starting to look at these issues. So just finally, um, I, that's part of this first step process. And as John said, we shouldn't underestimate the importance and the significance and the amount of work it will take to get those first steps moved into the more mainstream investment community and to think about how these apply. But as we're a think tank, we always like to challenge people. So. I think there's a broader set of issues as well for the financial sector and the investment sector in terms of thinking about what does human rights mean at a more, at a broader level in terms of your portfolios, in terms of the choices you've made. For example, a lot of issues have been raised recently around the commodification of food. And so a number of investors have moved out of food commodities because of the impact that this has had on developing countries and the right of access to food. There's also issues around um, thinking about um, other issues and where those motivations will come from to push this broader look at the financial sector. So some of it's gonna come from the human rights community. We see already that the human rights community is moving into looking at investors. If anyone <clears throat> wants to see a human rights look at infrastructure equity funds, go Google the Corner House report on this issue and you'll see a very different perspective on equity investments in infrastructure. But it will also, I think, come from the financial sector itself in terms of, so if your colleagues are not hooked on the human rights message, I think financially we will start to see that human rights issues really impact on the financing of a lot of projects that get done. For example, in project finance, maybe you've got an investment in project finance, you've got credit rating agencies are doing a credit rating of the project finance transaction, what happens when you have a concession with a government that's a counterparty and they're having a lot of protests against the government or against the particular investment? Credit rating agencies are starting to take a much more multidimensional look at risk and that will start to work its way into looking at the credit ratings. So those are just a couple of examples, I think, that will start to come from civil society with more of an emphasis on the broader impacts of the financial sector. John Ruggie talked about moving the guiding principles into the Burma reporting requirements, and I think it will come from the financial community itself. So that's just the start of the discussion. I think there's a lot more to be had. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks, uh, Bennett, uh, Margaret. Just I'll make a few comments. Keep me at 10 uh, minutes. And then we can really have a, a conversation. Uh, there's so many great resources in this room at, through the people that are here. And I think the challenge is to figure out ways that we can maximize this moment. Uh, it's right, Bennett, yes, that ICCR since its inception has been working on human rights, whether it's apartheid South Africa, labor rights in Central America, or the Maquila sector in Mexico, or issues related to infant formula marketing, where there, it led to uh, children you know, dying not because the family could not really uh, purchase 
the infant formula, or there wasn't potable water that could be used. All of those issues, up through sweatshop issues in the apparel industry, and conflict minerals, uh, human right to water and food, all of these issues have been with us a very long time. But what I think uh, this moment uh, is so important is along comes the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And those of us that have been actively engaging companies in a whole range of sectors uh, now have a kind of a common framework. And before, we were trying to sort of translate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as it got passed across the table, or the ILO core conventions that were a little bit easier to talk about because it was many of the conventions were actually promulgated into national law, although it didn't mean that they were fully respected or enforced by many of those uh, countries, or the, you know, the international covenants. And that was kind of a hard sell. <coughs> Uh, because the, how do you get over that sort of first hurdle of, uh, you know, investors talking to companies and companies saying this is really not our scope, that our, th th this is the scope of governments. And so I think th what we have is this incredible moment uh, where the UN guiding principles on business and human rights give us a common vocabulary. It gives us a sort of global a uh, norm that applies to the full range of human rights, that applies to any uh, uh, sector, that applies to any size of company. So we, we really have to get good at utilizing uh, that as a, as a tool. And I think the, what we're trying to do here is to take uh, especially that second pillar, although we, we have to say, and John always says certainly, that the three pillars, the respect, uh, you know, corporate responsibility respect in the center, but that first one, the state's duty to protect, and the last one, as, as Bennett pointed out, was just absolutely crucial, which is access to remedies, judicial and non-judicial, for, uh, for the victims, which is really, really critical in terms of the human rights uh, agenda. So to place that in a context that has within it, like the human rights due diligence process, so now the task isn't so much to uh, sell the notion of due diligence, that's there, but what does it mean to have a human rights uh, due diligence process? Does it just get folded into other due diligence processes? And I think the way in which the guide sort of takes the UN guiding principles related to the human rights due diligence and the corp corporate resp responsibility respect uh, helps to at least begin that conversation with some key questions. So like that principle 18, where you're really looking at uh, a lot of the issues that uh, are, are affect local communities. And I just have to say parenthetically before I make that point, that uh, we really thank the UNPRI for opening that whole space of you know, asset owners, asset managers, service providers, to have a conversation around the, what is material from a social, environmental, economic uh, sense. And I think that we really need to do a lot more work there. What we haven't done as good is the, the S in the ESG. And thank goodness the UN guiding principles come in here because human rights is at the core of social uh, sustainability, human rights of individuals, of, of, of communities. So I think that we, we can work uh, with UNPRI and others in trying to amplify the utter importance of human rights as a risk mitigation process, but also really focusing on risk related to uh, peoples uh, and communities. But principle 18, and may I quote for a moment the uh, commentary, uh, necessary components of like this process where we're trying to know and show and we need to have a human rights assessment there. And Christine, you were one of the first, right, with BP to do a human rights impact assessment. Bennett, you were involved with that. But we, we need to build on that and put it in the, this context and we know that assessing, and this is a quote, assessing the human rights context prior to proposed business activity is important. Identifying who may be affected, 
that's the no. Cata cataloging the relevant human rights standards and issues that are involved, and that has to include the communities and the, the affected communities, because the catalog can't just be done by investors sitting in New York or companies uh, sitting in Bentonville, Arkansas, or wherever. Uh, it needs to really be a part of uh, the, uh, the community. Uh, projects projecting that the proposed activity and associated business relationships can affect either positively or negatively human rights impacts. The word impact, I think, is critical in terms of taking the UN guiding principles and then applying it to the investor, uh, the investor community in all its various forms. Because uh, I think there's a growing sentiment that there's a, there's a real sense of inadequacy on the part of uh, company reporting, the you know, transparency, which when it gets to all the issues around human rights and uh, social sustainability gets pretty anecdotal. Uh, and there's not that sense of knowing, okay, if a given company is working, let's say, on a whole project of women's empowerment within the company as well as in the community, how are they measuring what the impact of that is? And I think the, the language of impact is so critical. So throughout the due diligence process, assessing the impacts and then really looking at how you integrate. So that integration, if we're, we as investors are engaging companies in the many sectors, uh, we also, our own institutions need to integrate uh, that process uh, internally. So if it's, if, if it's a public you know, pension fund, Mike Garland, or if it's an asset management firm or uh, an, an NGO that's working in the investment space, we need to really be able to look at that, uh, that integration. And then to really uh, accelerate within the investment sphere. And there's so many different ways that this guide points to utilizing the framework of the UN guiding principles. Uh, certainly, much more active uh, ownership. But before you get there, you need to look at your own guidelines. What are your criteria? Do you have uh, human rights criteria in, in your investment organization that really is aligned with the UN guiding principles? You know, it begins to spell out how that's going to get operationalized in your investment uh, shop. Because I think that's absolutely critical. The message here is that we can't simply look to companies to do what we think needs to be done in terms of due diligence and not do it you know, ourselves. There has to be an alignment. And I think pr good practice will become, there, there will be a lot of synergy uh, in that area. And we, we look forward to that conversation. So uh, in closing, before we turn to you, uh, we, we know that we've come a long ways and that the guiding principles are a moment that we don't want to, you know, we don't want to lose because part of it is a framework that calls out for further development. And I think that's what we're trying to do with the investment uh, guide here, but it's just a beginning so that when you really think about the various uh, people in institutions and how do they sort of put it into practice. That's really the question. That's the level where we are. So we have the framework, we have the guiding principles, and now we need to do that work. And it's serious work. It's really serious work. When we, we know, uh, we, every morning I go to the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, and there's so much there. But also just through the work of our members and others in, in a variety of industries, we know this is a life and death issue. We know that probably over 600 workers in Bangladesh have lost their lives in the last five or six years because of n no due diligence related to fire safety. We know that, that at least five people were shot and killed in Peru at a mining facility uh, because the, the mine didn't really address the human rights impacts uh, it was having on the community. So as we're looking at the guiding principles, as you're going to have a chance to read this, before tonight, we'll, we'll send out a survey tonight and get your feedback right away as to 
uh, what you think about it. But I think we're, we all know it's a very serious business, and we have to find ways that we can really inculcate uh, a sense of urgency, but also recognizing it's going to be a long-term uh, process. And I think that process uh, certainly has, has a good foundation.